Hello, Sherman. Thanks for being our first guest in this first episode of our Insight Insights podcast. So, can you tell me more about yourself before we get into the topic about yeah. security? Sure, sure. Thanks for inviting me and uh, good to be the first guest. <laughs> so, so basically, uh, maybe I just give a bit of background on myself, right? So, I've been in IT for over 20 years. Uh, so, for security, I've probably been here uh, doing the security about 15. So, I came across IT probably more on like from a young age where you want to play games. With a computer, then it's sort of gradually think of something that is sort of relevant to computers and then IT. Yeah. So that you can continue playing. So, so that's that's how, how I sort of got into the industry. And then from security wise, uh, it's sort of this interesting because every day is changing, right? I mean, it's even changing faster than, than the traditional IT uh, stuff. So, yeah, I've done from application development, service delivery, uh, you know. I work with systems from uh, IBM mainframes to mid range to cloud today, right? So, <laughs> and devil, uh, that that's bad. <laughs> that tells you how old I am. <laughs> no, but I know you're a specialist, yeah, in security. So you're talking about games, right? So what what are the games are you? Into? Yeah, so so I still I still do my own game gaming rig. So I still have a my last one is uh, still a good cool PC. Which I actually playing uh today, Elden Ring. Yeah, so it's something that released this year, which is it's quite popular. I, I didn't have much time to play it, but why? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, but a lot of uh, first person person shooters, yeah, you know, you're well and things like that. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, today's topic, right? Uh, we want to talk about this. You know, this paper that we recently published, right? It's really about proactive security and why it's important yep. in this. Digital first era, right? Yeah. And just to kickstart this conversation, from from your perspective, organizations today proactive enough in their approach to cybersecurity? I guess it, it depends. Uh, I think the answer would be say yes and no, right? Because it depends on the maturity of the organization, right? So I say, I guess from a bank perspective, they'll probably be more mature. They will have a lot of more proactive, uh, you know, people and tools and and, and processes. Well, versus say a, a typical manufacturer, right? Where you know, uh, security is not their primary business, right? Or they have less things from their perspective to protect. But in general, I think we are seeing a, a shift. Uh, you know, things are still people are still again moving to a more proactive approach, so that you can understand, you know, what's the risk to the organization. You know, what's critical to the organization, and then with the today's threat landscape, you know, uh, with today's threat landscape and Things are happening quite fast, rapidly, and you need to find ways. Uh, the, the the attackers are finding new ways to recognize the things, and then able to attack you. Right. So, so from a defensive perspective, we're we're also seeing that that move. And then there's a lot of uh, things where we talk about attack service management, where we pretty pretty much is really looking at you know uh, what it's what's the assets you have, you know what are the risks, what are the vulnerabilities, and then that is how you know we can gain some conception contextual, you know, insights into what's the organization's risk and then what are the imminent threats. Yeah, I mean, this is like a, a huge problem, right, these days. Like, if, if no action are taken, then, you know, organization is going to be toasted, right? Every week, you're going to see, like, news headlines about data breaches, cyber threats, cyber attacks, companies getting, you know, all into all these issues, right? So now we are talking about, like, proactive security. Maybe you want to give us some examples. Let me understand better. Sure, that's right. I mean, I mean, today you can see the probably on a, at least a weekly basis you see some somewhere somehow got breach, and that's quite a common. And that's probably the tip of the iceberg, right? Those are that's that's reported, which is reported big. ones, but they are unreported ones. Like yep, yep. So so when you want to look at proactive approach, you want to look at what's preemptively. You want to look at what's vulnerable within your organization, right? So that you can address them. You can, you know, before anything gets exploited, right? So. When you design security, you should design from a secure by design perspective, right? And then that's across organization and across all your infrastructure, your applications, and your people, right? Because people is always also the last line of defense. So you should look at things like security awareness, right? Mm -hmm. You know, is the people, if they are, if there's a policy or process, but they are not following it, that is as good as not having it, right? So things like 
you want to identify what are the assets in your organization, your hardware, software, on-prem, then the cloud, uh, what are the vulnerabilities for those systems, right? Even applications, uh, I mean, that's something that, you know, the organization should be doing, right? Segment your network. So if you do want to have your guest Wi-Fi with your network running on the same network, right? So that's, that's a quite fundamental, but you will be surprised that. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, they are organizing could be misconfiguration, could be when they, you know, do some troubleshooting, things were plot wrongly, differently, and it's, it's all kinds of interesting things. So they should do an audit, right? So you hear a lot about zero trust uh, approach or zero trust architecture, right? Uh, where you want to make sure that who is coming to, who is using the application, right? So that you can verify that. And then those that you're logging in or the assets that you're coming into are all properly configured. And of course, uh, probably last but not least, you have to look at threat hunting also, right? So, you know, if you have the telemetry, then we should be able to have someone or it would be the organization or you have someone to be able to help you to look at the threats in your environment. But that's threats are because today's attackers are quite uh, sneaky in the sense that, you know, they, they might be there for months and years. And while slowly they, they are trying to, you know, get your data out slow and steady right so each yeah sure. you are correct so 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 for with a try hunt then you can at least you know look at data that's 90 days or a year or over a year so it's still talk about cloud right and i'm just curious so you know a lot of organizations are like cloud first organizations do you see these organizations being more susceptible to this type of mm. cyber threats and why actually not because when you do a if you do it properly, it's probably not because there's always like best practices and, and so the challenge is always about, you know, uh does the people when they first design it, are they doing it properly, right? So so cloud organization, cloud native organization have a a different uh perspective on how things should be doing compared to a legacy, right? Like let's say you have a lot of legacy applications, uh, uh systems and things like that. But from a cloud, it's normally new built. And then you can, uh, it's always uh, typically you look at, it's more application driven, right? So you look at the, we hear a lot about Kubernetes, containers, you know, build pipeline, code libraries. So it's a lot of application related uh, risks. And then uh, you need to have the understanding about, you know, what the tools and, and processes that uh, you can help to mitigate risk, right? Compared to say a legacy where so a non cloud business We'll look at, let's say, a virtual machine, you know, and then the scalability also is also different, right? For a cloud organization, if you're, let's say, e-commerce over a Christmas, you can spin up hundreds of servers, hundreds of containers, right? You don't need to have, but for, for a traditional organization, they may have to build servers and things like that. that that's physical, could be a physical, or even VMs, right? Even mm-hmm. use VMs, yeah. So there, there's slight, slight variance on, on how, they, and each of them has, uh, you know, the own best practices to to secure them properly. Basically, just the, the difference is the model. So, what security control to better fit that? Yeah, that yep. model. The tools and, and how you want to manage those tools. Okay, I see. So, I mean, obviously, the the opposite of proactive security we're talking about, right, is is reactive, right? Um, for businesses today, I mean, how do you see them shifting from a reactive to a proactive approach? So, pro proactive is that we want to plan everything before you get hit by incident, right? So you hear a lot in the industry about shift left, shift uh, shift left, right? Where it's, when you say shift left, it means before the boom, right? So the boom is, uh, it's a term where I think with uh, when the US Army went to Vietnam, there was a lot of IEDs and then they always talk about having an IED explosion and that's it's the to them. And then you have the shift left concept where you try to prevent things from happening. Instead of trying to react on the right side of the pool. So that's that's how a lot of terminology comes into cybersecurity and <laughs> a lot of PG. Yeah, yeah. So it's some interesting background, right? So 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 from a traditional controls, you have like your firewalls, your antivirus and things like that that which is uh pretty static reactive. But uh, you may not have understanding of what are all your assets, right? You have no may not have visibility of, of Say you know, your building control systems, you know, your Wi-Fi controllers. I mean, what are they doing? Uh, could be someone plugging in your own Wi-Fi controller with 5G card and yeah, connecting to your network, right? Who knows? 
it's it's uh so so the challenge is of course then there's a lot more destructive uh ransomware today right organizations are feeling that you know if they don't do something they're going to have a, a challenge in trying to it's so it's starting off with a back foot rather than you know when you actually be able to proactively push the the risk and then manage able to manage the risk so so things like you want to deploy say like edr2 right yeah. A point detection response to, so that you can respond to a critical incident rather than well you are having some antivirus tool that which is can't do much about it, right? And then of course things like they say you know, inline uh, sandboxing, you know, where you can the tool which actually can hold your malicious files for analysis before actually releasing back to the network, right? Right. So. That's that's some of the controls that you know the organization should look at, and then uh, of course today we look at zero trust. You look at you know people are working hybrid, right in the office, out of office, could be anywhere, and then you would need to be able to have a planning to secure the critical assets, right? To what they are accessing your critical applications, right? So these are things that you should be able to to define and then and, and mitigate those risks. Us are like behind a phone applications or one way or another, be in a business or be as a consumer. I mean, to some point, I feel like we are becoming very oblivious to what's going on behind the applications. Or yeah, the yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I guess it's more or less intentional, right? You want to to have that interface so that it's easier for the user to to use it. To use it because it's a UI, UI experience. Yeah. But you know, at the back of it, it's like top concerns around things like the tape work. The, the cloud assets, the data storage. I think these are all top concerns raised mm. in the paper. Yep. Um, in terms of cybersecurity. Correct. Um. So of of all of this, right? Um. Which one do you see being the most important? So so from my perspective, or right, in all everything is important. Yeah. It's just it's, the moment one would probably from my perspective would be a data, right? So because data, it's it's uh something that would probably be critical to most organizations. And that should be the number one thing that you should be protecting. I mean, there's there's a lot of models about protecting your data. You secure your network. There's multiple layers of protection. Right? It's like putting it in a castle and then surrounding with defenses. Right? So, but I mean, we talk about when we talk about all this digital transformation that's going on. That that's been going on for for a long time, right? Since the days of client server, you know, your ERPs, your CRMs. Not sure where we school stuff. Yes, old school to you, but <laughs> I actually lived through those years. <laughs> it was it was old new school to many. Yep, yep. So so even then, but today you're seeing a lot of more uh, as people move to the cloud to the SaaS business, uh, uh, all the SaaS applications. You see that they are more looking at renting or you know of the of the sort of consumption based model, right? So the economics of it is different rather than rather than organization trying to own that asset. Right, so you're seeing that trend, uh, the economies of speed, though, I would say, right, mm -hmm. uh, where things will in the in the past it will be like it will be like a step ladder, right? You from this state to a uh, to be state, and then you build on it, right? But in, in today's world, it's really a, like a rocket, you know, <laughs> it's it's keep going. So so it's really about how the organization will fail faster yeah. and you know, evolve that and be agile to their to their business, right, to their uh, and consumers or their end users, right? So of course, things like using your AI ML, oh, sorry, artificial intelligence or machine learning um, to uncover new things for their new products, new patterns. So, and we're seeing a lot of uh, Web3 uh, stuff coming up. So, right? So those are uh, digital ledger stuff that, that will, little skin have a different uh, change, but that will be a data-centric from a personal perspective. So, what are you? Yeah. But of course, when we say data centric, uh, no, normally you really want to understand where does the organization's crown jewels reside, right? What application is using it? Uh, how is it being accessed? Who's using it? So basically, the the five W one H kind of questions, right? Okay, I mean it's quite popular. Right? Where is it? How is it? Uh, who's accessing it? You know, why why are these people getting access to it? Things like that. So once you're able to have that understanding, then you want to be able to classify those uh, data and then able to design that co correct protections around it, right? Because 
it could be different kind of data, right? It could be a credit card data, for example, it could be a medical data. It's a different uh, protection, different compliance requirements. So so you need to understand that as an organization, right? And then you need to identify who's going to access those, why they need to access those, right? But, you know, it's not really a set and forget. I mean, normally you do it once. So, I mean, some organizations will do it like once and then, okay, you know, but uh, you should really have a plan to constantly access review that and assess whether you know these people are why, why are they doing it why are they accessing those data is, is it a common thing for like businesses to just like set and forget it kind of approach <laughs> <laughs> that was very good uh, you'll find it quite common in, in most unfortunately in most organizations this is not really I mean of course if they are mandated for compliance by the regulatory boards then you mentioned like but banks, financial institutions, yeah, then or uh, new medical institutions, like uh, if they have on HIPAA or whatever, then yes, they will do their audit at least uh, you know once a year. But uh, most organization, well, for especially small organizations, they will they will have challenge in trying to to focus on that. They will rather focus on you know driving their business goals, you know, and cybersecurity is usually a afterthought for for their. <laughs> and of course, sometimes they also lack skills uh, because cybersecurity skill sets is also quite hot uh, I mean cyber security the talents is on the yeah yeah we are we are, we are short of businesses are, don't have the bandwidth today right correct 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 and, and perhaps businesses like this they should look at having a managed security services provider to kind of partner in and support them um, so what what we recommend them like businesses to look at when they want to like go after or select a MSS so MSSB definitely is, is definitely will help organizations because then they can take away all the the day to day challenges of monitoring it, right? So first thing usually you you need, probably need to be licensed uh, by the regulator. So for us, we are licensed for MSS and uh, penetration testing uh, in Singapore because Singapore there is a regulatory body that actually licenses all this uh, security practice. Uh, second, you want to have a the, the vendor would have to have a SOC that operates 24 by 7 by 365, right? You know, you'd want to have someone that runs a travel overshift and then good night. <laughs> so, so you want someone to be actually monitoring the alerts that's coming in and not wait till the next, next morning. So the customer can sleep in peace. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Right, right. Uh, then, of course, the, the SOC should be then staffed with trained people, right? Because, because they are some, although it's a shared service, but because they have the, the, the scale, then it can actually maintain the skill sets or you know uh, help the people to you know move up to a higher level skill sets, right? So they can maintain that, and then of course a uh, proven track record to you know providing a service to organizations uh, within your sector or within your your scale, right? Of course, the the last but not least probably would be things like looking around manage detection and response, right? Because uh, that's that's something that uh, traditional MSS uh, managed security service providers don't really do. Uh, so uh, it's also evolving, uh, where they normally will just do the security monitoring and then you know uh, call you up and say, yeah, let's fix this or let's do that, right? But today, I think the expectation is uh, for organizations to respond much faster to threats, and then the managed detection response would be able to, you know, at least from the SOC perspective, they will be able to help respond to a, a potential threat. And then able to even block those threats uh, to prevent that from from uh, infecting the organization. Right? So so basically, from a organization perspective, you want to automate. Uh, you know, look at those all these suspicious attacks and automate that uh, before you know all this impacts your environment. I just want to get a short response from you know, this. Um, I think when it comes to all this you know, screen trend, this then skip yep. right. I'm not sure like whether board level in organizations are taking it seriously because they are not the ones like going through the day-to-day -day process, you know, managing all these things. Yep. But they only kind of like feel the impact when it happened, which is <laughs> like too late. Yes. Do you think it's happening like our board level being more serious about security? Uh, definitely, definitely. I mean, uh, I mean, personally, they are, they are in, in certain countries, they are liable, personally liable, right? So, uh, definitely the board members are looking at it quite seriously, even though they don't experience it uh, day to day, right? So 
because they are liable for negligence. Uh, so we are seeing a lot more board members looking at on their at least on their regular meetings they want to have a cybersecurity uh, council or something. Or yeah, some yeah, or at least an update on what's the what's the status of the organization, what exposure the organization has, you know, what are they complying with, and you know how significant the incidents and, and the risk. So so you will see we are seeing that and. And then uh, in Asia, I think we are, we're also seeing that the board members are getting concerned also. Although they may not be liable, there's no compliance uh, reason, but definitely because of the reputation risk, right? Yeah. yeah. It's just a very big thing that you, no matter how much money you have and come by. Yeah, because then you're like, you're backpedaling it and you have to like figure out what's going to wrong. <laughs> Explain to you. In this case, right, security assessment be a good start. To look at an organization. Yep, definitely right. So, so, so from a uh, assessment point of view, right, it gives the organization their visibility, right? You know, so for us, I mean, we we sort of done a few of these things with uh, different customers, right, and and that that helps the customer to, if they're not doing it internally, then they need to find a partner to to do it, and yeah. we we've actually helped them to identify their risks. In the organization, what are their technologies, uh, the processes, uh, the challenges that verify all those things are in place so that they can actually safeguard the digital threats, right? Or if they are missing items or missing uh, weak linkages, then they can actually have a roadmap to map to you know what, what are the technology or processes or things that you need to change, right? So that they can be uh, safe. So, so when the assessment is done by the assessor, they will identify all the areas of risk for the organization. And then it could use something as simple as a weak password, right? Which uh, most organizations, but you'll be surprised that uh, like the SMEs. <laughs> password one, two, three. Four. Yes. <laughs> uh, someone's sticking a puzzle on their uh, screen and it's 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 uh, amazing, right? So so these are things that, that assessment will help organizations that will interview with the because the IT people may be the security people, certain also maybe the desktop support, right? So, for so especially for small organization, they really need uh, a lot of this kind of help. And then uh, for larger enterprise, you will see also a lot of third party and fourth party risks, right? So, so for example, a bank, right, you may have thousands of suppliers, right? And then what if those suppliers, some of them are using another supplier, a fourth party supplier, which actually has a critical path or critical impact to your organization if they get a breach. Right. So so all these things uh we are seeing uh, the large enterprises they are start looking at actually they already started looking at the party but even fourth party risk they actually start evaluating. Well I mean like there are so many dependencies in this aspect of like security right like uh the others when the gym uh, security supply chain. Yep supply chain. So it's like Murphy's law one thing go wrong everything will go wrong. Uh so maybe just to close out this conversation right lastly I just want to ask you, what's one advice, right, you would give to someone who is probably not a, maybe this person is not a security specialist, but this person needs to convince his or her boss about the importance of proactive security. What advice would you give this person? Right. Okay. Well, this, uh, <laughs> this can be, well, this, but I'll just try to shorten it so that, you know, <laughs> in a nutshell. Yes. Okay. So, but so, I mean, so security breach uh, happens everywhere. And even in the most prepared, you look at the, the, the list of breach organizations, right? The, from banks to defense ministries and stuff like that, right? So even you're most prepared, you 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 have a risk of being breached, and you want to be proactive to mitigate or reduce that that risk, right? Or the impact of that after breaches. So you need to be resilient, right? We talked about resilience now. Nowadays we don't really talk about you know preventing breaches. We talk about cyber resilience. Cyber resilience. Yeah. So key points. I mean, first of all, you should look at your what assets you have. The visibility is critical, right? Know what you have, and then uh, you know how you can protect that. We want to be able to have a in place a detection and response uh, capability, right? Able to detect, protect, and respond. I guess that's that's a so that you can properly protect your crown jewels and then make sure that you know you get the right protection around that. Then response uh, if there's an incident, so which means you have like an incident response plan, able to exercise those system response plan on a regular basis, so that everyone from the exco level to the technical team will have that exposure to the plan, and so that when the actual thing happens, that you need you minimize the time 
to respond to the actual incident point. Those are really good points. I, I better write it down later. <laughs> so I remember it. But, but yeah, thank you, uh, Matthew. Thanks for taking time to stream with me today. And yeah. I hope to see you soon. Yeah, hope to see you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Show button. Remember to show button. Thank you.